May I ask you to open your Bible at James chapter 3, and then I want to introduce what we are going to be listening to from God's Word this evening by reading to you a description and definition of the tongue. James chapter 3 and the passage we read is, of course, full of reference to the tongue. And here is the description of it that someone has given. To the physician, it is merely a two-ounce slab of mucous membrane enclosing a complex array of muscle and nerve that enable our bodies to chew, taste, and swallow. It is also the major organ of communication that enables us to articulate distinct sounds so we can understand each other. Without the tongue, no mother could comfort and sing her baby to sleep tonight. No ambassador could adequately represent our nation. No teacher could stretch the mind of students No officer could lead his fighting men in battle. No attorney could defend the truth in court. No pastor could comfort troubled souls. No complicated, controversial issue could ever be discussed and solved. Our entire world would be reduced to grunts and shrugs. A definition of the tongue, which inevitably comes from America. You could not escape America when I've been there for a fortnight. But we are obviously coming to consider a very important subject this evening as we come to James chapter 3. And James chapter 3 is probably one of the most important places in the Bible where we are taught about the Christian use of the tongue. Probably the only other place that is more important is the book of Proverbs. Indeed, if it is permissible to take a text from one part of the Bible and preach from another, I would want to take the text for this evening from Proverbs 18, 21 and then go on to expound this passage in James, which in so many ways is a sermon on that text. Proverbs 18.21 reads, Both death and life are in the power of the tongue. Both death and life are in the power of the tongue. Of the tongue. Now, for James's immediate purpose, I suppose the reason the tongue is so important is that he has just been telling us how vital it is that faith should display itself in works. That is, that you can test and examine somebody's faith best by examining the practical things that they do. James 2.17, for example, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And while it is true, as it has often been said, that we are saved through faith alone, saving faith, is never alone. It produces works which are the evidence of its reality. That's what James has been laboring. So he has been saying that somebody who merely speaks and says to a person in great need, God bless you, may you be healed and clothed, and says nothing else and does nothing else, his faith is empty. For faith without works is dead. 
But there is another sense entirely consistent with that in which the words that we speak display the kind of people that we are. And just as you can tell somebody's character from their works, you can also tell someone's character from their words. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 12, 34, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now you know what an overflow in a tank in your roof is for. It allows the contents of the tank to flow out through a pipe. And you know exactly what's in that tank when you watch the pipe and see it overflows with water. And James and Jesus are at one in saying to us, you can tell what is in someone's heart when you watch what overflows through their mouth, through their lips, by their tongue. And so in chapter 3, verse 10, James speaks to us about this remarkable anomaly. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, he says, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And James is telling us that our words are an index of our heart. And you can tell a lot about somebody's inward secret spiritual condition from the words that they speak. Now, because of this, I think, James introduces the subject to us in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, with a warning about going into the ministry. Now, that may seem rather odd and unexpected to you, but it's obvious if you think about it, that the kind of people who use words more than anyone else are people who are engaged in the ministry of teaching and preaching. And so James says in chapter 3, verse 1, Not many of you, my brothers, should presume to be teachers. Now, you will realize the emphasis is on the word presume. He is not discouraging people from becoming preachers and teachers of the Word of God. Nor is he discouraging those who have a genuine call into the ministry, as we would call it. What he is pointing out is that there is a solemn and inescapable responsibility for every Christian man or woman in the words that they speak. And when the very essence of your work is the speaking of words and the using of your tongue, then there is a more solemn and more profound responsibility that focuses upon that particular area of service. And so he says, since your main vehicle of expression is words, then it's an important thing not to presume to be teachers. That is, not to take this ministry on lightly or thoughtlessly or without the most serious consideration of the responsibility that goes along with the privileges. Now, I can think of no greater privilege in the whole world than being called and summoned and driven by God into a teaching, preaching ministry. I think of it as the most astonishing privilege 
that God has ever conferred upon me. But I am constantly reminded by Scripture of the serious responsibility that goes along with that calling. And here, James is pressing it upon us. What he is pointing out, you see, in this responsibility in the use of words is that we can so easily be at fault in what we say. Do you notice it? Verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a mature rather than a perfect man. Now, this is where, you see, it is absolutely vital that a Christian teacher is utterly committed to the truth of Holy Scripture. What he is talking about when he says that we are at fault in what we say in relation to the teaching ministry is that we are not leading people astray by what we say. That's the solemnity of being called into the ministry, doing it presumptuously, taking it lightly, and then being able to lead people astray by your words. Because, as we shall be seeing in a moment, the power of and influence of words is extraordinary. And that's what brings to the very gate and door of any man who stands to proclaim a gospel of his own and misleads people about the most important things in the world, and divorces what he says from Holy Scripture, makes him at fault in what he says, in error about what he is teaching. That's what makes it so serious. When I am at the high court... I hear people being sworn in as witnesses, and they are charged. Do you swear and promise? And they put their hand on the Bible to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And the witness says, I do so promise. Now, those who are teachers and preachers of the Word of God need to recognize that that is what happens to them when God calls them. He, as it were, says, raise your hand in my presence. Do you covenant in the presence of God to teach and preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth So help you, God. And James says, I tell you, he says, we who teach will be judged more strictly. The end of verse 1. That's a vital thing for us to keep in mind as we pray for people to come into the ministry we need to recognize the responsibility that is theirs. By your words, says Jesus, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. And if it is true of anybody, and it is true of everybody, It's true of you, whoever you are this evening, that your words are going to rise up and condemn you one day. For the same reason that our works are going to be the object of our judgment, that they tell the truth most deeply about our character. But if it's true of anybody... It's true of teachers and preachers. But it's not only this question of adhering to the truth. Let me point out to you something else. 
Professor Hort, who was a great Greek scholar, and some of you may know his name, wrote these words, mostly what he has written is about Greek language and so on, but he wrote these words which I once took down and they were a great challenge to me. The mere possession of truth is no security for the true utterance of it. For all utterance is so colored by the moral and spiritual state of the speaker that truth issues as falsehood from his lips in proportion as he himself is not right with God. So he says, let not many of you be teachers, because, in Alec Mateer's words, you will attract a closer scrutiny from God. That's the reason that I often say to people who are coming to discuss with me the possibility that God may be calling them into the ministry, I often say, if you can do anything else, you should. Now, they sometimes are surprised. And I say to them again, if you can do anything else, you should. It's a bit like getting married. (laughs) And I say that seriously to you. If you can seriously contemplate living the rest of your life without this particular person, then you should go and do that. If you can seriously contemplate being the Prime Minister of Great Britain, well, that's maybe not a very good example, but if you can seriously contemplate being a successful businessman or whatever, and that going into the ministry of God's Word is just another possibility, then you should go and be that successful businessman. Because there is something about the compulsion of God upon someone. You read the scripture and you will find that this is true. That makes it impossible for him to say no. Men run away from God. Send my brother, said Moses. I am but a child, says Solomon. I cannot speak. Again and again you find men crying to God. That they are unfit for this task. They do not want it. They cannot face it. And in the end of the day, they say, God drew me, and I had no option. And because of the serious responsibility, that's what James says to teachers and preachers. Now, he says, we all stumble in many ways, verse 2. That is, we are all of us frail, we are all of us human, we are all of us sinners, whether redeemed sinners even or no. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a mature man, able to keep his whole body in check. Now, do you notice what he is saying? This is broadening it out to become more general in verse 2. The mark of maturity. You notice what the mark of maturity in James 3, 2 is. The mark of maturity is being able to control your tongue. You got hold of that? The mark of Christian maturity and the evidence of the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life is not that you speak with another tongue, but that you're growing to be able to control the one that you have. And we wouldn't normally think about that, would we? What's the mark of Christian maturity in your mind? What do you think of as the thing that distinguishes those who are truly mature in Christ? Well, here is what James says. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a mature man able to keep his whole body in check. Now, the reason that's revolutionary stuff to us is that we don't think biblically about the tongue and its significance in our lives. 
comes as a surprise to us, for example, to find that Isaiah discovers the whole ground shaking beneath him and the glory of God making him cry out, I am a wretched, ruined man. Why? What is, what is the sin that he has seen in his own life? He says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now we tend to think of unclean lips as an amiable weakness. But Isaiah sees it as the very essence of what would cause the glory of God to burn him up. Now when we come to verse 3 of James 3, we come to the main body of what he is saying, and the rest of our time we'll spend on this. There are three main things that James wants to draw our attention to. Let me tell you what they are, see, so that you know approximately where we're going. First, he says the tongue is powerful. It can change lives. That's verses 3 to 5a. Secondly, The tongue is dangerous. It can destroy lives. That's from verse 5b through to verse 8. And finally, the tongue is indicative. It can reveal our hearts. But here's the first thing. The tongue is powerful. It can change lives. That's the point, really, of verses 3, 4, and 5, right through halfway of verse 5. And what James is speaking about is the disproportionate significance of the tongue. Two illustrations make that clear, and you will notice how he puts them. In verse 3, the first is the illustration of a bit in a horse's mouth. And the second, in verse 4 is the illustration of a rudder in a sailor's hand. Now, the bit in the horse's mouth and the rudder in the sailor's hand both point to the same thing. They show us that something very tiny has power to change something very great. The bit in the horse's mouth, if you've ever ridden, turns the horse round. At least that's the theory that they taught me when I remember being on a horse a day my family have never forgotten, I may say. The theory is that you pull the bit in one direction and the horse should go in that direction, but it does with somebody who is a proper horseman. And this is James's principle. You pull this tiny little bit. Somebody may say, how has that little child got that great hulking horse to turn round? And the answer is this tiny little thing that pulls the horse in its mouth. And it has a disproportionate significance. The same is true with this great ship. Here is a small, comparatively weak sailor. And he has the rudder of this great sailing ship in his hand. And people wonder as they watch, how is this great ship turned around? Is it the wind that's doing it? No. Does it have an engine that somehow or other turns it round? Or do they all turn over to one side of the ship? No. It is the sailor who's got the rudder in his hand. It's a small thing but it has a disproportionate significance. It does things far beyond its size would lead you to believe. And James is telling us that the tongue has the same disproportionate capacity to change lives. So he says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses, verse 3, To make them obey us, we turn round the whole animal. 
Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Now, the idea of the last phrase is it can boast of great significance. You know how we say the same sort of thing. And it can genuinely boast of enormous power because it really has it. Now, that's not a negative thing. That's something that we can take quite positively, that the tongue has astonishing power to do good. You think of it. Think of it in your own life. At times when perhaps you were at your wit's end, when life was seeming to be collapsing in upon you and someone came to you with a word that was clearly a word from God but they spoke to you and encouraged you and lifted you up and when you came out of their presence you felt a different person because words have that power listen to what the Proverbs say about it you really need to read right through the book of Proverbs to grasp the significance of this Good exercise this week. Proverbs 12:18. The tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 16:24. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 10:21. The lips of the righteous nourish many. Proverbs 12:25 A kind word cheers the needy. Now there are just so many people around us who desperately need encouragement and comfort and assurance and words so often are the vehicle of bringing that comfort and encouragement. You know how the godly woman is described at the gate in the last chapter of Proverbs. And one of her great characteristics is in her tongue is the law of kindness. And kind words can be like an oasis in the desert to someone there is no question whatsoever of the power of a tongue that is controlled by the grace of God and wielded by the Spirit of God and words spoken like that can actually change people's lives. You must have heard people say when they're in hospital and feeling awful, somebody has come to them and spoken a few words to them, and they have just been lifted up. Some of you may have known what it's like to be bereaved, and in the midst of that appalling, almost indescribable pain of sorrow, and someone has come and put their arm around your shoulder and said, I know exactly what it is that you're going through and they have spoken to you and you have found, people have said it to me, a burden has just been lifted. They have said it about some of you who have gone to see them. A burden has been lifted because the power of the tongue is so graciously used by God. And that's to say nothing of witnessing words and praying lips and the way we can use our tongues to tell the glories of the Lord Jesus. What disproportionate influence this little organ has. It can change lives. But the second thing is that the tongue is not only powerful, 
perhaps because it's so powerful, it's also dangerous. It can ruin lives. Notice in verse 5, halfway through, there's a third illustration that James has. Not now the horse or the ship, but the forest fire. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Now, the same truth is here, the disproportionate significance of the small spark and the great forest fire that can be produced from it. Now, there are parts of the world today where this is a real problem. When we were in Florida, they were broadcasting the dangers of forest fires in various places because of the dry winter that they have had over there. Amazing when you think of it, but it's true. There are parts of Australia today where the same thing has become a great problem. And you see, what is so dangerous is that just a spark can produce a conflagration. Now, says James, the tongue is just like that. It has a peculiar capacity to be used for evil. Notice how he puts it. The tongue, verse 6, is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire of hell. John Trapp, the Puritan, good man to speak about tongues if you think of it. John Trapp, the Puritan, says, evil tongues are the devil's bellows. Evil tongues are the devil's bellows. Now, James talks to us. You just need to follow the verses. They scarcely need comment about the influence of the tongue and then about the source of that influence and finally about the stubbornness of the tongue, its unwillingness to be tamed, its influence. Do you notice what he says in verse 6, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire. Now, the influence of the tongue, therefore, you see, even a little spark of it. Let me read to you some words that were written this time by an Englishman about this. This deadly drug, he says, does not need to be taken in large doses. A drop or two will suffice. The tongue does not need to distill long speeches. It has but to drop a word, and mischief is set afoot. Thus has peace been ruined. Thus has a reputation been blackened. Thus has a friendship been ended. Thus has a life been blasted in small ways. Our minds and lives poisoned by a word, by the poison of the tongue. And you know how it happens, of course, don't you? Proverbs has got a great deal to say about gossip. And you know the sort of thing that happens... Do you hear somebody? It can just be a short sentence or so. Do you hear what they're saying about so-and-so? You'll notice nobody ever says who they are. They are saying. And we never ask. We say, are they? Do you know what they're saying about so-and-so? What are they saying about so-and-so? And then sometimes, well, of course, it's just rumor, you know. But what they're saying is this. And then they tell you. You say, oh dear. Now they say, I'm telling you this. This is a good evangelical addendum. I'm telling you this just for prayer. <laughs> just for prayer. That makes it excusable. 
you see. And I often want to say, just for nothing of the kind, it's just for pure, evil, malicious, damaging, hell-inspired gossip. So it is. No wonder the psalmist cries to God in Psalm 141, Set a watch over my lips, O Lord. Because there are lives that have been blasted by evil speech and godless gossip and by words spoken in idleness. It was Charles Haddon Spurgeon who once said, as you could imagine, Blessed is the man who has nothing good to say and refuses to be persuaded to say it. There is an influence that the tongue has, and it is destructive. And it can be destructive in all sorts of different ways. It is possible to discourage and disable people by loose, careless, cruel talk. You know how easily that can happen. There is a certain form of humor which exists on the basis of hurting other people. Isn't that true? It gains its validity from the spirit of detraction. And it detracts from someone else in order to get a laugh. You know this sort of thing? And there are sensitive souls who are greatly wounded by that. And it's a strange kind of humor, isn't it, that scores points for ourselves by humiliating someone else. But that's often what happens in certain company. You notice how that spirit can work I remember being in the company of quite a small number of people. There was one man there who was greatly in need of encouragement, and he had got it. He had got it from somebody we all greatly respected in my younger days. And he got it through a book that was given to him. And inside the book, the man we all respected had written, I thank my God on every remembrance of you. And he came and tentatively and shyly said to us, Do you see uh, what he's written? And one somewhat bitter soul looked at it and said, Oh, yeah. He writes that for everybody. You could have seen the collapse of the spirit of that young lad. It's the spirit of detraction. You know. Well, the influence is one that extends through the whole of life. Do you notice what James says in verse 6? He says it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire. Now, that most scholars think refers to the span of his life. That is, the whole range of his years. And it may have a reference to the fact it's undoubtedly true that... um, This is something that doesn't cease to be a problem the older you get. 
There are some things that do cease to be problems the older you are, you know. Uh, There are things that become less of a battle. But this is not one of these. And a bitter tongue can pursue you into old age and right to the grave. The beautiful thing to hear that old nun who prayed, Lord, save me from becoming a bitter old woman. And I've got a theory that that begins quite early and that you need to pray from your childhood, Lord, set a watch. Over my lips, keep my tongue sweet. Notice the source that James says that it comes from. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and at the end of verse 6, it is itself set on fire by hell. That is, it's the devil that, it's the, that is at the root of it all. And these burning tongues that wound people, they are the fiery darts of the evil one. That's what he's saying. Look at its intransigence, its stubbornness. He says, uh, verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed, have been tamed by man, but nobody can tame the tongue. That's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? We can tame dogs, you know, one thing that we failed to do in all the 10, 11 years that we possessed a dog was to train it to do anything. Did absolutely nothing. But people can train animals. It's perfectly right. You can. People can train elephants to stand in a tiny little tub. People can train tigers to jump through fiery hoops. People can train lions to turn over and allow you to scratch their tummy. They can train people to do all manner of things. People can train pigeons to carry their messages. But the one thing we cannot train is our tongue. That's what James is saying. We can train animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea. They are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but nobody can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And once that poison has been released, you don't get it back. You ever thought about that? I dictate almost all my letters. I have become almost constitutionally incapable of writing a letter because I've got this marvelous privilege here in this church of having a secretary. And I dictate letters to him. But you know one of the nicest things about dictation? I tell you what it is. You can take your words back. You can say something in a letter and then you play it back over to yourself again and say, oh, well, I shouldn't have said that. And I can blot it out and I can record over the top of it and then I can say something different. But you can never do that with the spoken word between two people. You can't take your words back. I think it was... Adlai Stevenson, who said, or who is said to have said one day, Lord, make my words tender and sweet, for perhaps tomorrow I will have to eat them. (laughs) Churchill's response to that was, and this has got nothing to do with James, but Churchill's (laughs) response to that was, I have often had to eat my words, and I have found them a most nourishing diet. (laughs) But the trouble about them is that you cannot have them back once you have spoken them. And that's the serious influence of words. And the last thing that James has to say in verses 9 to 12, the tongue is indicative. 
One of the Puritans has the phrase, the tongue, an index of the heart, and so it is. Look at verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. What an inconsistency, he says. Because when we are praising God as our Father, we are praising the very image of his glory. When we are cursing men, we are cursing the one in whom the image of God is to be found. How extraordinary that that should come from the same tongue. The inconsistency of the Christian use of the tongue. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, says James, this should not be, and the reason it should not be is in verses 11 and 12. You cannot get both fresh and salt water from the same spring. A fig tree doesn't bear olives, nor a grapevine figs. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So what we're really asking about when we discover that our tongues are bringing out bitter things is what's the condition of that heart? Now, isn't that precisely the point that James is making? It is out of the abundance of the heart, as the authorized version puts it, that the tongue speaks. You know how the doctor says to you, well, they used to say when I was a small boy, the doctor used to say to you, and you went with something that seemed rather vague and general, let me see your tongue and you put your tongue out. Ah, he said, but of course he didn't immediately start to attend to your tongue. He would turn and write out a prescription and say, take that for the next ten days, and you should be all right. What was he doing? He was using the tongue as an index of our health. And he said, of course, the problem is not your tongue. The problem is deeper. And that's the point. We are not to go away from here, a frenetic crowd of demented people trying to stop speaking to each other in case we make some kind of ghastly mistake, are we? But what we are to do is to cry to God, Lord, so change my heart that my tongue will speak the law of kindness, 